Hey, good morning. Good to see you all today. A few people in the hall already, and I know there's a bunch watching at home. And if you are watching at home, or whether you're here in the hall, let's be ready to enter into the worship of the Lord our God. He is a good God, and He always does good things. We thank Him for that. And let's just stand wherever you are, in front of your TV or your computer, and let's lift up our hands without wrath or doubting and praise the name of the Lord our God. I love you, Lord. You have blessed and never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. You saw my is not dependent on how we feel at any given point in time. The truth is, this morning I got an early wake-up call because Sarah Cordell was supposed to be sitting here and leading us, but she's sick, and I just thought we should maybe just pause a second and just lift up a, um, a 
prayer for healing for her. Lord God, I just pray right now for Sarah that you'd go to her where she is, that you would touch her and, and uh, strengthen her body. I pray that you'd drive away the, 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 the ill feeling that she has right now and restore her to complete health in Jesus' name and by your Amen. power we pray. Amen. Amen. One sign that God is good is that He chose His very own Son in His goodness to make a way for us to come to Him. He paid it all. He paid the debt of all our sin. We could come into His presence. This grand old hymn helps us remember that. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength and need is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all.
never anything that we could do, is it? It's only through the work that God does in Jesus, through, in us through the Lord Jesus and through what he did for us. Amen. It's not us. It's only him all the way. What gift of love is Jesus my redeemer? There is no more Thank you. We praise your name. We welcome you in this place. Amen. Let's be. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Yay! 
It's great to see some uh, new faces and uh, also some we haven't seen. Uh, so welcome back to those who are here that haven't been here for a bit. It's great to see you. And uh, for everybody at home, welcome and thank you for joining us. It's great to be together as God's people. Um, this is our seventh Sunday since the third lockdown back together, and it is great to gather together. Uh, for those who are at home, just a reminder, we are going to be celebrating uh, communion together today and sharing in the Lord's Supper. Though you are uh, part, we are going to remember the Lord's shed blood on our behalf. And uh, as we come to this table, it's what brings us unity and reminds us of the hope that we have today, tomorrow, and in the future. So it's great to be able to celebrate that together. As we start, Psalm 46 reminds us of this. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is, no, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in an uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and sh bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Let us just pray. Father, we thank you so much for this truth that you are our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. We thank you, Lord, that you are always there for us in trouble, in good times, that you never move away. So we thank you, Father, for this. And we come together as a church this morning to celebrate your goodness, to remember your death on the cross, the victory that you have won, that we know we're not worthy to come here to... Um, to worship you, but because of your son Jesus who died for us, paid the price for our sin, you welcome us in. You've made it so you, you tell us to come to you, and we thank you for that today, Father. We thank you so much that we get to lift up our voices, given our tithes and our offerings back to you to be here. So encourage us today, Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and let's sing that song. Come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to see. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. Walk by faith in God who burns the chariots in fire. Amen. 
At this time, just a few quick announcements for our church family. Um, The first announcement is, this is going to be a bands of marriage. We haven't done this in a really long time here, but uh, we're going to read out the bands of marriage, which we have to publicly do for uh, David and Katie. So David and Katie are right here. They can kind of wave up front. They're getting married at the end of July, so I just have to read this. And uh, yes, yes, yes. Very good. (laughs) Awesome. There you go, eh? That's great. So it is with great joy that we publish the bands of marriage for David Robert Moses Nunn and Katie Vanessa Vera of Forward Baptist Church, Toronto. This marriage is to take place at Beach Hill United on Winneva Avenue in Toronto on Saturday, July 31st. If anyone knows of any just cause why these two should not lawfully married, let them declare it. Excellent. Uh, Also, (laughs) for Katie, this is actually Katie's last Sunday. Katie's been a uh, summer intern here for the last three months, and um, because she's getting married, this is her last Sunday, or as an intern, she's still going to be here at her church, David and Katie. Um, She's just not going to be working here anymore. Um, They're going to be getting married in end of July, and then they're actually going to go be going to El Salvador for another wedding and celebration there. So you can be in prayer for them as they travel. And Katie, thank you very much for all of your service here uh, these last three months as well. And I'm going to invite up uh, Franca and Gloria. So Franca and Gloria have been with us for the last 10 months, and uh, they are from Liebenzell Ministry, and uh, Liebenzell Mission, and they've been serving with us for the last 10 months here at the church. At first, you've probably haven't, you've seen them and haven't seen them, because I think you guys can come over this way, I don't know, we're in this, um, they've been doing everything uh, behind the scenes. They've been helping with Pew Pew Puppets and sending out emails and doing so much, and we're so thankful for both of you and your just tireless work, and uh, they always have smiles on. I know you can't see them right now, but they have been a joy. It's been a joy to just have you here and to serve with you on this ministry team as you have served our church, even though you didn't really get to meet them right away. You still just jumped in and served, and uh, these past this past month, they've helped with two of our summer camps, Um, with our summer interns as well, and I think that's probably been a highlight. They came here hoping to do lots of uh, ministry with uh, people, and that was not what this year was, but they still came faithfully and served well, and we are going to miss you both. And uh, I'm just going to pass the mic to you, and you can kind of tell us just what you're doing in September and uh, maybe what we can pray for you about. Um, In September, I'm going back to school, and I'm going to study psychology, Um, and I'll probably get engaged to my boyfriend at the moment, (laughs) so, um, yeah, you can definitely pray for my boyfriend and me, and um, I don't know, maybe for school, and I also just want to say thank you for um, everything you've done for me, and for welcoming me and Gloria here, and um, I've grown so much during this year. Um, I think I've never grown as much in such a um, short time as I've grown here, and I'm really thankful. Even though it was a difficult and challenging year, I'm, I'm thankful for your openness and for letting us be part of this church, and I really miss serving here often. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just want to thank you for all of the friendships and for the Christmas cards, for the cookies, for praying for us and um, for yeah, being so open to have us here. Thank you. Hello. Um, in September, I will also go back to school. I will be studying um, international business, probably. Um, I will have to move and find a new church, so prayer for that would be great. And... Yeah, I can also just say again what Franca already said. I'm so happy that I was able to be here. Thank you for everything that, yeah, you were so open and welcoming. It was really a blessing being here, and I will miss you all. Well, thank you, ladies. We're going to just pray 
Sean's going to come up and pray, but I just have like a prayer blessing that we're going to share with you as you go. So um, let us just pray. Even in our goodbyes, there is a blessing, for the sorrow of parting is a measure of the depth of the bond we have come to share in Christ. Thank you, O God, that we do not walk this road alone, but that this journey toward eternity and toward your heart has been from the beginning, one that you ordained we should undertake in the glad and good company of our fellow pilgrims. Thank you, O God, for the mercy and the beauty incarnated in the words and acts of these, your people, extended one toward another. It is no accident that we were born at this same time and that our stories have been shared in this time and place. As Franca and Gloria go, we pray, Lord, and we remember that as they go forth to steward each other's stories that we have shared. So be present in our works, Lord, in our words. Be present in their hearts. Be present in the bonds of our community, Lord Christ. Be ever at work among us and through us. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you so much that we can be here together. We, we praise you that you have made this church and, Lord, that you have established us here in this neighborhood. And, Lord, we would ask that you continue to bless the ministries of this, uh, this local church as we reach out around us. And, Lord, that you would be glorified. Lord, we thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you for sustaining us and for protecting us and for providing for us. But Lord, most of all, we thank you for the good news of the gospel. We thank you that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. We thank you that you paid for our sin in full. A debt that we could not pay, you paid for us. And the death that could not keep you in the grave, uh, you, you conquered, you rose again. And Lord, we thank you that you hold all power. You hold all authority. And Lord, we trust you. We would ask that you, you strengthen us as we share your gospel. Lord, as we reach out to others in, in our circles, Lord, we would ask that you would be glorified. That you would allow us to articulate your word. And Lord, that you would bless our obedience. And Lord, that as we interface with people, that you would save them. Lord, I had asked that you'd already start to prepare, prepare their hearts as, as you prepare us to go out. And Lord, we would ask that uh, you would pour out your mercy and save many. Lord, just to echo Aaron's words, we thank you so much for uh, Gloria and Franca, just that they could partner with us for this short time. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless them as they, they head back to Germany. And Lord, I pray that... Um, they could just articulate the, the time that they had and, and just express how much joy they have. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless Liebensal as, as they provide these uh, missionary interns with us. And Lord, I pray that we might provide a rich and rewarding experience for them. Lord, we thank you so much that uh, we can trust you. We, we look around us and we see floods and fires and we see sickness Yet, we know, God, that you are in control of all. We're not anxious because we know that you're walking with us. And, Lord, we pray that you might continue to be merciful. Lord, that you would save many, that you would spare life. Lord, you are a good God, and we trust you. But you're also holy, and we pray that your purpose may be established. Lord, we rejoice um, over the fact that Many people have had cancer and have been uh, diagnosed as being in remission. And Lord, we know that there are many more who are struggling. And Lord, we pray that you would walk with them. Even though it seems terrifying, you are with them. And Lord, I pray that you would give them strength to bear up under their, their sickness. And Lord, we, we pray that um, you would just strengthen them and, and, and encourage our hearts to come alongside and, and just lift these dear individuals up. Lord, we'd also ask that you provide for those who are uh, in need, looking for jobs, 
Lord, you know them. You know our needs before we even speak them. So, Lord, I pray that you'll be with these individuals, that, Lord, you would continue to uh, work on their behalf. And, Lord, I pray that uh, they would be encouraged and not give up their, their, their searches. And, Father, I, I pray for the deacon and elders meeting that is coming this week, Lord, that you would be with us, that our time would be profitable. Um, Lord, as we lead this church, we pray that you would just encourage us. And, Lord, I pray that uh, we would do our uh, duties well, and, Lord, that we would uh, seek your face always. Father, we thank you so much for the missionaries that have gone out from us and that we support. And, Lord, I pray that during this difficult time of COVID, um, you might just be with them as they rethink their ministries, help them not to despair, help them to trust in you. And Lord, I pray that you might open up a way for them to share the gospel with the people groups that they have gone to. And finally, Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the monies that you've entrusted to us. We thank you for uh, giving us everything that we have. Every breath that we draw is yours. And Lord, when we give it back to you, I pray that we might just give you glory and whatever it is that you prompt our hearts to give. So Lord, be with us today as we worship you more fully. We ask this in your name. Amen. which is not ours to give, demanding costs not ours to demand, making self-serving gains which belong to God and his people. <laughs> oh, that was a good joke, Simonius. You almost had me there. What can I say? As long as we don't get caught, am I right? church family. Uh, just as an add-on to what Pastor Aaron was saying about our wedding, um, we're actually inviting all of you to join us online, if you so wish. Um, it will be done on the church, well, the live streaming that the church does, so you just have to go to forwardbaptist.com, um, and on there you'll see the link for the 
uh, live streams, and we'll be doing it on there. So you're all welcome to come and see us virtually online um, due to the fact that we aren't allowed to have crazy amounts of people all in one place. Thanks. Um, so today's passage is from Luke chapter um, 19, starting at 45 into chapter 20 till verse 8. <clears throat> when Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but the chief priests and teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they couldn't find a way to do it because all the people hung on his words. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and teachers of the law, together with the elders, came up to him. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? They said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John the Baptist, was it, was it from heaven or from human origin? The dis they discussed among it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask us, why didn't we believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they were persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, we do not know where it was from. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. May God bless his word. Let me add my good morning to everyone else's good morning that you've already heard. It's good to see you all today. You know, one of the things that surprised me uh, as a parent the most, as a parent of small kids, is that literally they know nothing. And you kind of know that, but you sort of don't realize exactly what that means until you have to teach them, like, everything. Everything that just sort of seems stuff you take for granted. You know, I mean, Hannah is only five months old, so she's not really there yet. We just kind of keep her alive and love her, and we'll teach her stuff later. But MJ, who's two, you know, we teach her literally everything. Anything she knows, she's picked up from us because we've taught it to her on purpose or because she's absorbed it from us. You know, we've taught her how to walk and how to use a fork and how to go to the potty and how to brush her teeth and how to say please and thank you and sorry and I forgive you. The weird thing about all of that, though, is that pretty much all of those lessons are just teaching her how to repeat words and, and motions, right? Do this, say this, do this, say this. And I can't really get her to understand it. I can't make her understand any of these things. I just have to get her to repeat the motions and the words, and hopefully, eventually, she understands it over time. For example, in, in brushing her teeth... <laughs> She knows that when she's done brushing her teeth, she's supposed to spit. And so every time, every time she brushes her teeth, she brushes her teeth with help from us, swallows all everything, and then goes, I pit. <laughs> every time. Nothing comes out. She doesn't actually spit. It's very cute. And I'm sure one day she'll figure that out. When, she comes, when it comes to saying please and thank you, right, she's pretty good at that, actually. She's actually kind of cute when she does it, too. But so far, I'm pretty sure she's only learned this is the acceptable custom for getting people to give you what they want, or what you want, right? She hasn't really learned the, the lessons of you can't demand things from people and you should be grateful for what they give you, which is kind of what we're trying to get her to understand. And it, it's even worse when it comes to saying sorry. She knows that when she does something wrong, she's supposed to say sorry, but man, she's a, a pro at deflecting. She's, she's really good at it. She, she tries to be funny and cute and distract us from it and move on to the next thing. And when we kind of stick to it and we say, no, MJ, you have to say sorry. Say sorry, Daddy. She kind of avoids eye contact. Sorry, Daddy. And, and, you know, just whatever I can do to move on to the next thing. The truth is, though, 
I do the same things all the time. You know, early in my marriage, it was a fairly common occurrence that I would do something dumb and hurt Becky's feelings, uh, and she would want me to apologize, but I would think that she was being unreasonable. So I would say, oh, I'm sorry that you're hurt, which I was told over and over again is not an apology, does not count. I, I, have, not <laughs> I have not acknowledged that I did anything wrong. I have not actually apologized, and Becky didn't buy it. And I'm, I'm happy to... Happy to uh, announced that after seven years of uh, sensitivity training, I have, uh, <laughs> I have learned that I'm not always right, and that even if I think it's unreasonable, I should care that my wife is hurt and I should apologize. But even, even more importantly than that, even more importantly than my marriage, as important as that is, I do that with God all the time. I was, I was raised in a Christian home. You know, my, my parents taught me about Jesus from before I can remember. I learned songs, so many songs about Jesus as a kid. I mean, I went to church and Sunday school and learned all the stories, and I, I learned from my parents about praying and what it looks like to go to church and how to be a, a good Christian, and I went to Bible college and then seminary, and I've been a pastor for 13 years, and uh, and I've kind of picked up what it, what it means to, to look like a good worshiper of God over those times in the past 35 years of my life. I'm really good at the external stuff of what it means to be a Christian. But that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily really worshiping God every time that I come to church or, or do things on my own. That my heart is really in the right place. And, and what's further true to that is, you know, take away the whole Bible college and being a pastor thing, the same thing is true of you. Whether you were raised by Christian parents or have become a Christian more recently, you've learned to mimic certain activities and actions that we call worship, which is a good thing that you've learned those things. But just because you've learned to mimic those outward actions, it doesn't mean that your heart is really worshiping God whenever you do them. And in fact, this passage that we're looking at today from the Gospel of Luke shows us that some of the things that we do that we call worship make Jesus angry because they're not real and they're empty. This passage of God's Word is a mirror for us, as God's Word always is, that we hold up to our face and we're supposed to see how it reflects ourselves back to us and the things that we need to learn and we need to grow in. As we look at this, I want to ask, and I want you to ask, do I see myself in these religious leaders whose empty worship made Jesus so angry? There's a challenge in this passage for us, and it's this. To not be content with just going through the motions of worship, but to pursue true worship of God. Don't be just content with going through the motions of worship, but pursue true worship of God. And as we look at, we're going to see these negative examples in this passage and Jesus' reaction to them. And we're going to see through that two truths about what true worship is and how we can pursue it in our lives. Excuse me. So the first truth that we're going to see in this passage is this that true worship celebrates God's holiness, goodness, and love. True worship is a celebration. It's a praise of God for the good things that are true of him, for his holiness, for his goodness, for his love, and we could list a myriad number of other things. True worship celebrates God's holiness, goodness, and love. So remember as we enter this passage that we've just begun the fourth and final act of Luke's gospel. Luke has been showing Jesus traveling to Jerusalem, preparing to come and be crucified, rejected by the people crucified, buried and, and raised again on the third day. And last week we saw Jesus arrive in Jerusalem with a triumphal entry and the, people, the crowds praising him and recognizing him as the Messiah, the promised king of Israel who had saved them. But even in the midst of that, there's rejection and Jesus, mourn, Jesus mourns over the city who's going to reject him and be destroyed. And so as we start to think about 
the coming crucifixion of Jesus. You know, we're, we've been in Luke a long time. It's, we're, we're getting there. We're almost done. October. We'll be, we'll be finished. As we, as we look towards the crucifixion, we're going to see in the story how we start to get there. Why Jesus gets so horribly rejected by the people. And it really, like it started earlier, but it really starts here in a, in a big way. Verse 45, chapter 19 of Luke, says this. Luke 19, 45. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. Now, all four Gospels give us the account of Jesus driving people out of the temple. But Luke's is the, the briefest of all of them. He doesn't say a whole lot about it. He doesn't give us the context that we need to really understand this well. So here's what you need to know. Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, at this time at least, uh, was also the worship center of the nation. By God's design, the temple was there, and it was the centralized place where you come to worship God. God didn't want people offering sacrifices to him all over the place and doing it however they wanted. There was a lot of really strict rules about it, which if you've ever read Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you understand how many rules there are. So the people had to come to the city, to the temple, to sacrifice, and particularly... There were several festivals during the year where they they had to come. They were required to come if they were healthy and able to Jerusalem to offer a sacrifice. One of those festivals is happening right now. It's the festival of the Passover. And so right now in Jerusalem, the, the population of the city has swelled to more than twice of what it normally is as pilgrims are coming into the city to offer the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. But the reality of this is people are coming from a long way away by foot And it's a dangerous journey. And so bringing a sheep or a cow or a a goat that needs to be sacrificed over a long distance isn't practical. It has to be without blemish. It can't be, you know, hurt in any way. So it just doesn't make sense. So in order for people to be able to fulfill what God's law has required, this market that Jesus comes into is actually necessary. It's a good thing, right? Right? You may be familiar with the story, but you you may not know that, actually. They couldn't fulfill what God had commanded them to do without markets like this. And even the money changers that Luke doesn't mention, but other Gospels do, in order to pay your tax and part of your tithe at the temple, God's word required you to do it with a Jewish currency, which most people didn't use. They used the Roman currency as an occupied nation. So the money changers exchanged that, that money so that they could do what they were required to do in God's law. So the question is, if this market is a good thing and it's necessary, why does Jesus have such a literally violent reaction to it, right? Luke's gospel says in verse 45 that Jesus drove people out. If you read some of the other accounts, he's flipping tables. He literally makes a whip and starts, you know, chasing people out of the temple with a whip. Why is he reacting so violently to something that is actually necessary and good? Well, I mean, if you are familiar with this story and you've grown up with it, or you were able to hear the puppet show, the, the initial reaction that we have is, well, they were robbing people. They were, they were cheating people in the temple, right? And, and Jesus kind of seems to say that in verse 46. He says, when he, when he speaks, he says, it is written, and he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So, right, that idea of being a den of robbers it seems to be the, the problem, right? That they're cheating people in here. And, and that may be the case, right? So in John's gospel, Jesus specifically goes after the ones selling the pigeons or the doves, which is a sacrifice for the, the, the poorest of the poor. If you couldn't afford even a sheep, you went and you bought a dove for very little money and you could sacrifice a dove and God allowed that. And so it seems to be in John, Jesus is saying, even the poorest people you go after. But that's not the main reason that Jesus is upset in here. If if that's the case, that they're cheating people, that's not actually the main reason. When Jesus says to them, you've made my house, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, into a den of robbers, if you think about that, robbers don't go to their den to rob people, right? They go out of their den to rob people and then come back to their den to be safe. And, And maybe you think, well, see, that seems a bit nitpicky. If you think about it and you look at what Jesus is actually saying, that's actually his point. Because when Jesus says in verse 46, it is written, it means he's about to quote from the Old Testament, right? He's going to quote from the the Jewish scriptures. 
And he quotes from two passages. He, he quotes from Isaiah 56, which talks about how God wants his house to be a house of prayer for all the nations. And then he quotes from Jeremiah 7. He says, though God wants it to be this, you've made it this. Jeremiah chapter 7 is the one that Luke really focuses on. That passage took place about 800 years before Christ. And in it, God speaks to the people and tells them why he's about to let them be conquered and let their temple be destroyed. If you remember in in history, Babylon attacks the nation and destroys the temple. He says, this is why it's going to happen. So let me read to you a few verses surrounding the quote from Jeremiah 7, starting in verse 9. He says, Will you steal and murder and commit adultery and perjury and burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known and then come stand before me in this house which bears my name and say we're safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. In that passage of Jeremiah, the context isn't, you know, you're coming into the temple to steal from people. He says, you go out and you live lives however you want. You're you're sleeping around, you're you're cheating people, you're worshiping other gods, and you think you can get away with it because you come back here and you say, in in the temple, I'm safe. You treat my temple like a, a safe haven for bad people. Or another way we could put it is you're treating it like a good luck charm. I've done my religious duty for the day and now I don't have to worry about anything else. It's covered. I've confessed it. You think I'm going to protect you because you've jumped through the hoops? No, I'm, I'm going to let you be conquered and let my temple be destroyed. So here's, that was what God was saying to the Israelites in Jeremiah's day. Here's what Jesus is saying to the Israelites in his day. He says, your ancestors treated the temple like a good luck charm, thinking that they could live however they wanted to and come back here for safety. And, we, and you know that God hated it then, and he let his temple be destroyed. But then he let you come back, and he let you rebuild, and now you have another temple, and you're doing exactly the same thing that your ancestors did, and exactly the same thing is going to happen to you again. That's a little bit confusing. If you, if you, if you know, kind of, if you remember back the story of Luke, the people of Israel in Jesus' day were very, very strong in their religion to God, right? They weren't going around sleeping around. They, they, they were trying to follow the laws. They were taking their worship of God and God alone very, very seriously. They were very strict in their religion towards the one true God. But also, if you've been following with us through the Gospel of Luke, you know that they didn't see that as a way of recognizing that God alone is holy and great, but as a religious activity that made them worthwhile, that made them better than other people and self-righteous, that their actions of worship God weren't really about God, they were about themselves. Putting God in their debt because they've done certain things and now God has to bless us and protect us. They want to look down on others, the Gentiles, the the so-called sinners, so they can feel better about themselves and exclude them. And and possibly make some extra money by ripping them off in the marketplace. Jesus says this is just as bad. You've just swung the other way and are doing the same thing on the other side of the spectrum. So that's what Jesus is saying to them in their day. Here's what he's saying to us today. When you worship, when you worship God, what is worship about for you? Why do you worship God? What does it even mean to worship God? Do you see yourselves in the mirror here of God's word? Is your worship empty like the people of Israel's worship was? True worship is about recognizing and celebrating God for his holiness and his goodness and his love. It's about his glory, his goodness, his holiness. And here's what we need to remember, right? God is unlike us in every way, right? He's our creator who made us. He is the standard of right and wrong. He is the one who never does anything sinful or bad or evil. 
He is the one who is sovereign over all of our stories. He wrote them from the beginning to end. He decrees what happens to them. And he is great and unlike us in every way. And so when we worship him, we lift the name up of that God. And remember that he has chosen to love us when we don't deserve it. We thank him for that. We praise him for that. We honor his name. But so often, we twist worship and make it about ourselves. We quote, worship God as a religious act that covers us for another week so we can go back out and live our sinful lives and live however we want. We don't celebrate God and his holiness. We dishonor it. We mock it. We, we pit on it. We spit on it. We try to use God's holiness. Do you know how stupid it is to use God's holiness? It's like saying, I'm in danger from somebody, so I'm going to go hide in a hurricane because they won't follow me in there. That hurricane isn't going to honor you. It's going to blow you away like it will blow anyone else away. In the same way God cannot be used, he will not stand by and let his holiness be mocked. On the other hand, we, we quote, worship God as an act of our own worthiness and righteousness. Because we think we're good people, we've earned a place with God by our religious duties and good deeds. We may not say it outwardly, but we think we're better than people who don't live up to our standards. Even across the room from you today, people that you judge, people that you know that don't come to church or don't believe in God. You think you're better than them. We make worship about us instead of about God and his holiness. Remember the, the parable that Jesus told back in chapter 18 about the Pharisee who prayed? I thank God that I'm not like other people. Robbers and evildoers and adulterers. We, we become like that guy, which is so stupid. It's like a flashlight that thinks the sun will be impressed with how bright it is. It's so stupid. This is the, so, the kind of so-called worship that Jesus gets angry about. There's no time for it. But here's a hard question for you. If Jesus was to walk in the doors today, would he drive you out for your empty and useless worship? I don't want to short change that question. I think we need to think about that and let, let ourselves dwell with that. But as we do, we also need to remember something else. Jesus doesn't just drive people away all over the place. He doesn't do it lightly, right? He's not like these religious leaders who, who do whatever they can to exclude and ostracize people that they think they're better than. Or Jesus has been shown all the way through this gospel to accept and welcome and love sinners. He's done that in his life on earth, and he does that today as well, which is the only reason that we can come here in the first place. For all sinners who come to him in faith, repenting from their sins, turning from their sins to follow him, he doesn't drive us out. So, so here's what you need to not do. You need to not think, and I need you to hear me on this. You need to not think, Jesus would drive me out because I've sinned so much. And I, I don't deserve to worship him. I don't deserve to be here. He did, I mean, if everyone else knew what I'd done, I, they wouldn't want me here either. You can't, you can't think that way. In fact, if you know that about yourself, that you don't deserve to be here, you're on the right track. Right? All that's left is to say, and yet I know he loves me and accepts me because he died on the cross for my sins and rose again. And therefore I can be grateful to him for loving me because I don't deserve it. And I shouldn't be accepted, but I have been. And that's when you're worshiping. When you're celebrating that God for who is more holy than you. And who is better than you, but is still so loving to you. The, the problem is, though, all of us forget that. We forget God's goodness. We forget his holiness. We forget his love. It's, it's so easy to do. It slips our minds so quickly. 
We fall back into our empty and twisted ways of worship so easily. And that's the, the reason that we need this second point. The second truth about true worship and how we pursue it. We've seen that true worship celebrates God's holiness and goodness and love and everything else about him. But secondly, we're going to see that true worship transforms your heart. The heart that so easily slips away into forgetfulness and twists worship, it, it changes us. True worship transforms your heart. Look at verse 47, Luke 19, 47. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do so because the people hung on his words. And then going into chapter 20, one day as Jesus was teaching in the temple, or sorry, teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came up to him. So the religious leaders, they don't respond well to Jesus, right? They don't like him. They hate him. They're trying to figure out how to kill him, which is obviously going to lead us to the end of the story. But they know they can't just go and arrest him because the people love him. They're hanging on his words. They're excited about him. And the people won't take it well. So they're trying to figure out how do we discredit him? How do we get him arrested? What do we do? So they're trying to, like, the, the, the next couple chapters are going to be all about that. They're, they're going to come to Jesus. They're going to try and trap him in his words and, and make him say something dumb. And Jesus just runs circles around them. They're just, they just, he embarrasses them every time. So attempt number one starts in chapter 20, verse 2. And they say this. Tell us by what authority are you doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? In other words, who do you think you are coming in here and flipping over the tables in the temple and disrupting our worship? Who gave you authority over us to do this? Who do you think you are? Now, they know who he thinks he is, right? They know he's gonna, that he could say that he's the Messiah and that God gave him that authority, which is something that they reject. They question him. They're hoping that they can find a way to charge him with blasphemy or, or discredit him in front of the people. And here's the thing. Jesus is smart, right? He knows everything. He knows the question isn't asked in good faith. They're not just, you know, curious and eager to learn more. They've made up their minds about him and are trying to trap him, so he doesn't give them a straight answer. But he answers with another question. Verse 3 says, he replied, I will also give you a question. I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? So if you remember, John the Baptist was sent by God as a forerunner for Jesus. He's a herald of the king. His ministry was to get people ready for the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus, the coming of God to his people, telling them to turn from their sins and start really following God and be ready, be ready for the day of the Lord's visiting. And he challenged everybody, the Romans, the tax collectors, the normal people, the Pharisees. And, of course, the Pharisees didn't like that. There's another guy challenging them. They, they hated him. Because he challenged the Romans, he eventually got beheaded by King Herod, which the Pharisees were fine with. And so Jesus says, tell me where John's baptism came from. Was it from heaven or from, was he just a lunatic in the desert? And they, they want to answer this. They want to say, well, he was obviously a lunatic in the desert, but they can't. Look what they say in verse 5. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they're persuaded that John was a prophet. So the Pharisees can't say that, Jesus, that John was a, a lunatic in the desert because they're afraid of the crowd. The people love John and believe that he was a prophet, which he exactly what he was. He was a prophet. He was from God. His baptism was from heaven. And so the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they're afraid of the crowd. They don't want to get killed. But they also, so they can't say he was just from earth, but they also can't say he was from heaven because then Jesus will turn around and say, well, you should have believed in him. And if you should have believed in him, then you should believe in me because he was talking about me. So like a good trained politician, they give a, a cop-out answer that doesn't give them any answer, Right? You know, if you've ever watched those debates on Parliament Hill where they just yell at each other and don't say anything, that's exactly what they do. That's, oh, well, we don't know. Do you see what's going on here? These, these men, 
the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders of the people. They're the religious leaders of Israel. Their job, if they're right about Jesus and John the Baptist, if they really are false teachers leading people away from God, or if they're convinced that they are, their job is to stand up and put a stop to it, right? If someone came into our church and started teaching things that was starting to lead people away from the true gospel, from God's word, the, the job of the elders of our church would be to, to make sure everyone knew that that person was teaching falsehood, to get, like, get rid of them. We wouldn't try to kill them or anything like they, they were doing, but you know, it would be to stand up and say, no, this is wrong, don't listen to him, and, and try to make sure he doesn't come back, right? And that would be our job even if you hated us for it. Even if I lost my job as a result, if I didn't stand up and say, this is wrong, don't follow him, I would be unfit to be a pastor because I would be a coward in the things that really matter. So even if the Pharisees are these, these religious leaders, even if they're right, they're cowards, right? They don't really care about God's honor. They care about their honor. They're going to do what's best for them in every situation. And that's why they hate Jesus so much, because he challenges them on that. And that's why he runs circles around them and embarrasses them every time. Verse 8, Jesus says, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. I'm not going to talk to you anymore. We're done. But here's what we need to see in this passage, right? These religious leaders who are unfit to lead the people in worship because they don't care about God's glory, they care about their own. When they're faced with God's truth, they start dodging, right? They're never going to give a straight answer because they don't want to deal with it, right? Their, their defenses go up and they're, they're, they're dodging the truth. They're avoiding it because they don't want to change. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want to lose where they are. They're just, they're never going to deal with the truth. And it's despicable, and you and I do the same thing all the time. All the time. How often does your worship sink into your heart and really make change in there? Or, or to ask this negatively, how often do you read your Bible and pray and then not even remember what you read a few minutes later? How often do you sing song at church while thinking about other things or your mind wanders during prayer? How many people did that today? How many people did that today knowing they were preaching on this? I bet I'm the only one there. How often do you hear God's word preached to you and know it's challenging you, but by lunchtime you're on to the next thing and you don't think about it anymore? How often do you know you need to confess your sin to another Christian because you need help, but you're scared and so you don't, or you soften it so it doesn't feel as bad? How often do you take communion and know that as you celebrate the death of Jesus for your sins that your life has not been honoring him? And in that moment when you're about to take it, instead of doing some real soul searching, you just say, I'm, God, I'm sorry God, I'll, I'll help me do better next week. And you kind of glance over it and that's all that you ever think about it. Every single one of us dodges God's transforming power that comes through worship. We have really good armor. We're really good at this. But you haven't worshipped unless God's transforming power has pierced through your armor and ripped into your heart. True worship transforms your heart. It reminds you of God's holiness and his goodness and his love. It reminds you of your own sinfulness and your need for faith and repentance. It puts up a mirror to your face and says, look at this mess and how God's dealing with it. Isn't he great? Isn't that encouraging? That there's hope for you? That he's already started to do some good in you? It's not because of anything that you have, because of what he's done? Isn't he praiseworthy? Isn't he amazing? True worship overwhelms you with gratitude and joy and peace. Listen, the truth is all of us are imperfect worshipers. Some of us are, are more emotional than others by nature, right? So we, we, we look really good at worship. 
And some of us are, are just more mature in our faith, more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And so we, we are better worshipers than other. But all of us fall short. Every single one of us. Some days worship is going to be like MJ brushing our teeth and pretending to spit. Right? We're just going to go through the motions. I worshiped. And it's not going to be true. And, and, and God knows that about us. Right? That's why he sent Jesus in the first place. Jesus who, though he really did deserve to be in the presence of his Father unlike us, didn't cling to that, as Philippians 2 says. And he, he came and he humbled himself to live among us. And though he didn't need to be transformed by worship, he did it anyway for us, in our place, perfectly. And though he had never sinned in any of those things, and didn't deserve punishment. He took our punishment for us on the cross, dying in our place because we could not give God the honor that he's due in, the, in the, the acts of religion or in the way that we live our lives. And so he died for us. And then he rose again, defeating sin that is so prevalent in our lives, defeating the death that we all deserve. And then after he rose again, and he went to be with his Father in heaven. He sent his Spirit to dwell in all those who put their faith in God through him. And that Spirit gives us new life. And it helps us to change and grow day by day and love God better and worship him more appropriately. That's how we worship and it's also why we worship. Because of these truths. It's the reason and it's the way that we do it. You know, we go through the acts of worship. Some days meaning it less than others, but hopefully every day praying for the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives to warm our hearts up to the things that we're saying and the things that we're doing so that though there's nothing in us that would do it on our own, we begin to actually worship, worship Jesus in spirit and in truth as he puts it. So as we sing a couple more songs today, and then as we take communion, and then as we fellowship a bit outside and go about our, our ways and do our next thing, let's remember him together. And let's celebrate who he is, his holiness, his goodness, his love for us, and what he has done in Christ and his spirit. To, and so let's allow him to transform our hearts today.
Let me read to you as our benediction today, and then I'll, I'll dismiss us. We have to go through the dismissal protocols if you're in the, bot, in the building. But let me read as our benediction today, uh, Revelation chapter 5, verses 13 to 14. John says, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, Praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And all f four living creatures, these angelic beings, said amen. And the elders, these other angelic beings, fell down and worshipped. May we worship God like that today, this week, in our lives. May God bless you today. So for our dismissal protocols, again, we had to go roll.